Welcome to another episode of the Angels Weekend Chat with June here, Espresso, Casper, Johannes, and Rubble. And also, happy Chinese New Year to everyone who is celebrating it. Before we start, Casper, would you mind giving us the usual intro of the Angels Wing? Yeah, sure. Welcome, Jan, to our Angels Wing Chat. We are the Angels Wing, an international NFT art gallery and podcast show founded by friends around the world who met through our beloved Metal Angels project. As Yoon introduced us just now, Espresso, Johannes are from Europe, Yoon is from the US, Rebel and myself, we are from Asia. We are driven by our common passion to showcase independent artists and their art, and helping them stand out from the crowded NFT market that's dominated by generative 10k PFP projects. We showcase the art in an on-cyber virtual gallery, as a larger collection of art typically brings a cross-pollination of viewership that has helped quite a few of our artists' friends reach collectors through sale. We've organically grown since into a community of artists and collectors, but most importantly, friends. With regular Twitter spaces like these, which are then recorded into podcast formats in Spotify and YouTube. The easiest way to get in touch with us would be to join our cozy Discord. Everything's on our link in our bio, so hit us up if you're an indie artist who needs help featuring your art, or if you just want to join a friendly art NFT community. Last but not least, we like to mention that nothing on this show should be construed as investment advice. This podcast is for informational purposes only. And thanks, everyone. Back to you, Yoon. Thank you for the intro, Casper. So today we have Jan Baumgart on the show. Jan is an artist from Germany specializing in minimalism. And I stumbled upon Jan's amazing work last year on Twitter when I was in the German time zone. So I've been quite intrigued by Jan's background in architecture and returning since then. Welcome, Jan. So great to have you here. Do you want to start to introduce yourself first a bit and tell us about your background and how you found your way to making art NFTs? Yeah, thank you very much for your short introduction. Thanks for having me, by the way. It's really great to have a space like yours and to talk about art in general or specific art from each artist. Well, what can I say about myself? I studied architecture quite some ages ago. And studying architecture is always pretty creative. It's pretty wild, to be honest. But after I finished and graduated as an architect, I learned pretty quickly that being an architect and working in an office isn't that great anymore. It's like a proper job. I needed something for myself to be creative. I needed a creative output or whatever you want to call it. That was like probably 10 or 12 years ago when I started creating art for myself, actually. But I never really shared it. Then I stumbled onto Instagram and started sharing visuals there. I grew a small community over there over the last couple of years, met some amazing friends, and some of them are also now NFT artists around the globe. Since then, since sharing my stuff on Instagram and switching over to the NFT space, it was actually a pretty wild journey since then. I started sharing my works by the end of 21 on Twitter. Since then, I met so many amazing artists around the world and I got so many friendships that really inspired me every day. It's still around me all the time. Yeah. That's an amazing journey. So if I understood you correctly, you're still working as an architect, right? So you're just doing the art on the side. No, I completely switched. Yeah, I worked several years as an architect. Being an architect is always like working from nine to... It's not from nine to five. It's like 24-7 almost and working weekends. So I decided I needed to look for a job that wasn't that time consuming. And I switched to software development. Actually, I'm not a software developer. I'm a product owner. But that really helped me. I just got more and more time back for myself and for my art. I see. Yeah, makes sense. But architecture did influence your way of making art, right? Absolutely. Um, it was 100% the main influence, I would say for myself creating art. When I studied architecture, I met a lot of friends who are now working or being partnered in large, I would say, minimalist architectural offices. And that was actually always my main topic, even at university. But previously, you also did an apprenticeship in wood turning. That was ages ago. <laughs> <laughs> but I remember you said you still enjoy working with wood, right? On the side. Yeah, absolutely. My father is a carpenter. Whenever we have to do handrail or whatever, we are always using wood. 
as a material. Being an apprentice and learning how to turn wood was probably the first time I really got into how to shape a geometry or how to create something that is physical and you can use. That was, I would say, pretty inspiring for myself. Maybe explain to our audience first what turning actually is, because I think, remember, when I first talked with you about it, I didn't even know what that is. Let me explain it. Well, how do I explain wood turning? If you have a handrail, for example, or you have an old house and you have a handrail and between, how do you call it, the sticks underneath the handrail, the round wood, that's actually what a wood turner does. He or she turns the wood the way that it gets curves. <laughs> Sorry, I can't really so it, explain how that. You did well. Actually, it's, it's similar to pottery, right? You just yeah, shape yeah, it yeah, something absolutely. round with wood, right? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. And it's actually a very old traditional profession. It is. And when I did this apprenticeship, we were only six apprentices in the whole of Germany. I had to travel to a town called Bad Kissing, which is like 400 kilometers away from my hometown. That was a wild time. <laughs> just five of us from the whole of Germany. Yeah, pretty traditional. Yeah, very interesting. So there's one thing I wanted to know is that, would you say that the idea of minimalism actually started with architecture, something that developed during the beginning of the 20th century? In, in general? Where would you place minimalism in general on the timeline, either in art or architecture? I somehow had the impression that minimalism developed first in architecture. Well, how do you see this? Well, well my touch points are actually back to, let's say, 1960, when the whole movement, like, Donald Judd, Ellsworth Kelly, and so on, and Frank Stella were hardly fighting for the genre. But I'm not sure. I heard the rumor that for Clint, Hilfer Clint, also did some works by the beginning of the 19th or 20th century. So it's probably old. Yeah, let's say it's old. Yeah, that's Hilfer of Klimt. Yeah, right. I think she also yeah. did some works that recently got into the media, right? Yes, there was this exhibition and they also had a digital release of some of her works. I think some of it uh, you could buy digitally. So yes, I did notice that in the news. And I wanted to add that I've read that also minimalism was some kind of the answer for the Bauhaus style. And Bauhaus is even much older. And yes, so you could even say, I know some minimalists wouldn't agree, but Bauhaus and minimalism have some things in common, right? So it's Absolutely. I mean, it was like, let's say, for example, Adolf Loos, who also wrote a lot of essays about architecture and also about the society as well. These essays were from like 90, I don't know, 1908, 1920 or something. Back then, he already said that I think one of his most popular essays is Ornament and Crime. He was already talking about leaving all the small details and just focusing on the essentials of architecture. So, yeah. Yeah, before we dive deeper into your art, Jan, I wonder, is minimalism also something that you embrace in your personal life? I think you identify yourself as a soul minimalist, right? <laughs> Maybe you tell us what that actually means. That's a good question. That's a good question. Well, to be honest, I do have a family. I would say I would love to live like a really minimalist guy, like having just one bed, one sheet, one chair, one table. But life isn't that easy. So I do have two kids and a wife. And I wouldn't say I'm living the whole minimalist lifestyle. It's pretty minimalist, yes. But it can always be more and more or less and less. But I just discovered for myself that whenever I create art, and that's when this whole soul minimalist thing started for myself. Whenever I create art, I need to find pleasure for myself. I need to find something that is just as minimum as possible but I can get the maximum out of it. Sometimes it's more and sometimes it's less. I would say the whole soul minimalist idea is actually based on this idea of having just really a few things, but how do you say it? Embrace them as much as possible. Yeah, I can totally understand that. And also children in general rather create chaos <laughs> and increase <laughs> entropy. <laughs> <laughs> which is completely the opposite of uh, minimalist. But uh, that's just part of life. I mean, nowadays, minimalism, it's a mainstream, I wouldn't say genre. It's like you can live minimalist style. You can do art minimalist style. You can even uh, photography minimalist style. So it's hard to define, you know. It's not just minimalism in general. is so diverse and so powerful that you got to pick what you want within this whole minimalist world. 
Yeah, that's very true. So what I find very common in minimalism, particularly in art, is the focus on geometrical shapes or reduction of compositions to geometric shapes. But I think your art actually focuses a lot on creating actually empty space and working with the illusion of light and shadows. You have also mentioned that your work refers to the past. What do you actually mean by that, re referring to the past? Well, whenever you start working to, with geometries and colors, there is always someone who already did it the way you want to do it. For example, I love to tweet about Ellsworth Kelly and Donald Judd and Laws of Vitals and so on. Some of the works I create for myself and I don't share them, they are pretty similar to their works. Just the angle is a bit different, the color might be a little bit different, but the main idea behind it is the same. And That's not because I'm copying it. It's just sometimes I just stumble upon some of their works and I think, whoa, holy shit, they already did it. Okay, I mean, having a, let's say, a rectangle or a curve, for example, in a certain color isn't that complicated. Yes, that's true. It's not complicated. But when you start seeing things within your work, you don't want to cut that off. You just want to go that journey and see wherever this leads you to. If the result looks similar to some of their works, That's okay. That's absolutely okay because you're working just with so less elements that it's almost impossible not to look like Ellsworth Kelly or not to look like Lorser Fiddleson and so on. And that's actually what I think working with geometry is about. Having just a plain geometry or, for example, and that's what I do with shadings, for example, I try to put in another layer, one for myself. I try to add more story to it because if you want to talk about, let's say, a colorful rectangle or a colorful shape, it's probably easier to give a bit more space to the whole artwork and then just add a title that might be interesting to open the door for someone just to walk the path you already created within your little minimalist world. I hope that doesn't confuse too much. <laughs> no, it doesn't. It's, you explain it very well, what you mean by referring to the past. And this is totally relatable. You create something just from your own mind and you suddenly find out that it already exists somewhere or a similar version already exists and it's just pretty mind-blowing. So when you find yourself into that situation, you just, as you already mentioned, you just build on top of it and create your own story. I try to add elements and most of the time I add elements and realize adding an element wasn't a good idea. So let's say 95% of the artworks I create, I just save on my hard drive and will never release because there is just let's say, one layer too much or one color too much or too much content in it, which is also really like working in the field of minimalism is always like reducing all the content. And that's why Donald Judd and Frank Stella also did works that really had no humanity in it. So you had to bring yourself to the artwork and then the whole interaction starts. And that's always a struggle, creating an artwork and putting content in it, which isn't the 100% minimalist idea back from the 60s. And I just love their idea, but I'm also struggling to be, let's say, the hardcore minimalist from 1960. They were really fighting against everyone else and reducing all the content within the pictures or their works. That is actually true that oftentimes uh, minimalists, I think particularly in Bauhaus and the Bauhaus movement, people try to create something that strips everything away, that strips all kinds of emotions away. While in your work, I think you are particularly interested in creating emotions by using bold and vivid colors. Yeah, I think also in, in both. I mean, using, let's have an example. If you're using yellow or green or red, and you will also see yellow, green, and red in a totally different way, because within our mind and body and head, the colors are always connected to your emotions, and these emotions might be completely different. So having a red painting might be for three people completely different reds. And these reds might be connected to completely different situations within their lives. And so I think the colors are the main characteristics within Bauhaus. There's also geometry, of course, but the colors are actually the ones that transport emotion. Yeah, I agree with that. What would you say is the main component in your work? Is this the space or smaller colors? Well, that depends on the series, actually. Sometimes I try to challenge myself when I try to use less color and give space, actually, the dominant part of the artwork. And in some works or some series, for example, the Fragments series, 
I try to just maximize the amount of color. So there are actually just two or three colors, but they are really bold. They are really, really strong. And these colors can also just change the whole mood of your idea behind the picture. And in two of your collections, I think I have them right now, a problem with my internet. <laughs> I'm trying to <laughs> access your website on my computer, but somehow it doesn't work. But just from memory, you have the Spectrum collection yeah. where you introduced, I think another one too, another collection where I introduced figures, right? I find it really interesting the way how you introduce people into your work. So do you want to share a bit about that? Of course. My beginning working within the field of minimalism, I started actually because I was used to cut out people for architectural visualizations. And I found it really interesting to use these persons and put them in, in let's say, environments they normally wouldn't be. And that was the first time when I started to just go out and take with my phone pictures from people standing and waiting for a bus after they had a long day in the office and they seem pretty emotionless and pretty, how do you say, drained? No, I'm not sure if drained is the right word, but they really like had a hard day and they're just waiting for their bus or for the underground. And that were actually the moments when I got my phone out and captured them from the back. And having this emotionless people and putting them into, let's say, vivid environments, vivid and geometrical environments, really made me think about how just a simple color can change the view you wouldn't have on this person. Because, for example, when I waited there on the bus station and I just photographed the person and there were many others around and it was raining and the whole scenery was, how do you say, pretty lonely... When I just got back to my computer and I cut them out and put them in front of a red circle, for example, the interaction between this person, the scale that person brings to the artwork and the color, which is so intense to me, that I needed to go this path and I needed to find out what this journey would bring me to. Yeah, I really enjoyed this journey. And that was actually also my starting point, working with really less elements. Yeah, I think like the first collection you created, Spectrum 1, it has more like a different mood than the one that I put into the banner with the people in front of this bright yellow background. Absolutely. And but this is not the first, actually. The first one was the Curve series. I don't <clears> have it on my website, but the first <clears throat> NFTs actually I minted were from the Curve series. These were all people showing faces. I didn't want to do that anymore, putting faces, because faces send you emotions already. So if there's a person smiling, you would feel this kind of emotion. And I wanted to delete all the emotion and just wanted to let the color send you this kind of emotion. And then I completely got into working more and more abstract. I also deleted the persons and just focused on geometrics and colors. Yeah, very interesting process. I somehow remember that you once mentioned that you dislike using black and white, right? Because it's kind of emotionless or... <laughs> but I found one piece from Spectrum 1 where you actually use black and white with a person in that yeah. piece. And it really still creates this feeling of loneliness. I think this fits into your initial idea or the initial observation of people standing alone or waiting in front of a bus station. It comes across pretty well, I think. Um, yeah, I don't have many artworks using black and white, to be honest. The most of them having some kind of color in it, even if it's a dark blue or dark green. I just don't use black that much. I think it's just, I don't have that many positive, let's say positive emotions connected to black. I mean, black is always pretty hard, pretty sharp, and I can't handle black that good, I would say. Yeah, I think it's also super interesting to hear how you actually create your work. I think you start actually with your compositions on paper, right? Yeah, most so of them. Do you want to yeah. share a bit about that and the way how you actually choose colors? Because I think that is also a very extensive process. Yeah, it depends completely on the series. Normally when I start, the quickest way for myself to create an, a geometry, for example, or a shape is using a pen and a paper. And that's actually when I just try as fast as possible to see where this journey is going to lead me. So I try to just scratch some geometries. And when the geometry, let's say, tries to tell me something, or I see at least a little bit in it, and I think, well, that might be interesting. Let's see where this path leads me to. 
then I actually just try to build it up digitally and whatever geometry I do have created on my laptop. In the end, I just try to use the color and which is always connected to my mood at the day. And that's also because I'm always listening to techno, for example, and uh, to try to really focus on my works and whether my mood is good. That might be, let's say, a yellow or a red, for example, or a light green. And whenever my mood is like, I had a bad day or whatever, that might be works when I'm using like dark blue or a dark green, for example. I never did that, but normally I, sh I should view all my works and see how my last year was <laughs> because I could see how my emotions were each day. <laughs> You know, I always thought that the way how you create your work or the colors that you use somehow correlates with the mood that you have, right? This is what people yeah. usually think. But, you know, I've just been to Rothko exhibit in Texas, and there's a chapel that has been created in the 1970s, shortly before Rothko committed suicide. And it's composed of really dark work that I have never seen before. It's just like 16 real huge paintings of really dark work. Mm. And what I've learned is interesting is that he has also created a lot of like very colorful work during his lifetime. And according to his family, he has phases where he was really depressive, but created colorful work. While mm. he has been in, let's say, less depressive phases in his life, where he created really dark work. So it's very interesting that for some artists, may not really correlate. Because before, I also thought that it's, there's a correlation between the mood and the color choices. Just a side note. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's pretty interesting, actually, to see, let's say you're having a pretty bad mood or you're depressed and what color can change your mind. And having a bad day and creating a vivid yellow artwork might be a cool thing, actually. I mean... This is something that you do for yourself. I'm not doing the art for anyone else. I'm just doing it for myself. And when the outcome is I enjoy the artwork way more in a moment that I'm having, let's say, a bit struggle in my life, that's actually, that's pretty cool, to be honest. Yeah, I can totally relate to that. We have also questions from Kovos. Casper first. Yeah, hi, Jan. Just helping to ask a question from the Discord. Minimalism? seems to be a relatively abstract concept and of course might not be so easy to appreciate right because i think a lot of particularly amateur collectors tend to think of minimalism possibly as maybe lower effort than the rest of the art pieces how would you answer to a question like this and how do you think laymen or collectors should approach minimalist art yeah, that's a pretty good question by the way i think well minimalism in general is a really as I introduced myself, I said it early on, minimalism is really like wide genre. You can have minimalist photography, you can have minimalist AI art, for example, and you can also have this kind of minimalist abstract art, which I would say I am doing right now. And I think, sure, you can say drawing a certain geometry on a paper and adding, let's say, one or two elements is easy to do. Sure, it is. Some works just take five minutes. I'm completely honest about that, but the 450 works I did before, and I tried to do this geometry, and I tried to perfect it, and I failed. These times, nobody will see ever. So I think this is not an issue in architecture, in minimalism, but in art in general, because some works, they just, they seem pretty easy. But if you're really putting in the time to try to understand what the artist tried to say, or even just open up yourself and try to walk this journey he invites you to. When you're at this stage, you are already further on the road. You're already opened up for this journey. And I think it's not about how much effort or time or how many elements you put in. It's more or less how effective they are. I do a lot of works that are really just shit. But some works I would say I just love. And some works I share and some works I don't share. And that's just because... When I see certain things within an artwork, I feel that I reached my goal. And if this goal is that somebody else will also enjoy my artwork, then I'm totally happy. Yeah, that's a great response. I think it's very relevant, especially to the age-old question of whether photography is art, right? I think we had a chat about this before in one of our past podcast episodes about how a photographer just takes that one shot, which is one second, but it's the composition and it's the thought process behind it. So yeah, I would tend to agree with you that your value add comes from putting it all together, but 
not at that single, not just at that particular instant. So thanks yeah, very no, much. No worries. I think in art, it's always the same. Not every art is for every person. So some people will like minimalism art and will try to see more of your art or into your art as well. And I think that's art in general. I mean, we're here to discuss art and some might be not that interesting whatever yeah that might be or you just didn't put enough time in it you know what i mean you, you always have to interact with an art piece you can't just say well that's yeah, nice yeah. or that's not nice well yeah that's taste probably but if you're putting a lot of time in it and try really to understand what the artist went through and some artists for example elsworth kelly i really admire elsworth kelly he's my hero he just puts out a, a geometry and paints it red and calls it red and you have absolutely no clue and then you just start to dig you see okay that's a red that's a red geometry and then you start to investigate and try to get more information about Ed Ellsworth Kelly where did he go what did he do in his life so what brought him to paint this artwork and then you realize wow this is perfect I mean this is great and yeah that's what I mean yeah that's a great response thanks very much Jan for sharing that thanks uh, Johannes? Yeah, I have a more fun question. So you said you are listening to techno. You are from Germany. <laughs> so uh, please tell me that you are listening to Kraftwerk while you are doing this. Sometimes, yes. But I want to be honest, Kraftwerk needs all your attention because they are just masterpieces or whatever you want to call them. So normally when I listen to Kraftwerk, I just listen to Kraftwerk and enjoy the ride that they are offering me. So I would say I'm listening to way more monotone techno just to have the right mood for creation. But Kraftwerk, of course, Kraftwerk is legends, legends. That's the right answer. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I'm embarrassed to say that I have never heard Kraftwerk before. <laughs> no? Oh, no. <laughs> you have to. You definitely have to. I mean, they influence the whole scene. They're like, oh, my goodness. <laughs> Grandmasters. <laughs> so much. You, you yes. should cut that so, out. Okay, I will give you some facts. It's the beginning of everything. Every genre has copied some things of Kraftwerk. They made sound samples a thing. Wow. Yeah. I have to send you videos, a lot of them. <laughs> and you will also notice that some of their works are like really long. It's not like two or three minutes, like 16 or 18 minutes. Rex. And they're almost reading a story. And you got to listen to the story to understand the whole idea behind that work. So, yeah, I love Kraftwerk, of course. Do you know Kraftwerk? I suppose I remember you also like techno. Oh, yes. The legend. Okay, I see. It's only me <laughs> who hasn't <laughs> listened to them before. <laughs> Gonna fix this after space. So I was wondering, Jan, what else inspire you when you create your work besides music? My main inspiration, I would say, just like the old artists, as I mentioned before, like from the 1960s, there's not like everyone else could say it's nature, it's whatever emotions you have attached to a day. But I'd say it's more, a, how do you say, it? meditative journey, because I just drop the music. I'm listening to the music and try to find pleasure for myself. That's pretty much it. I just love the ride of listening to really good beats and freeing my head. And just see where art and colors and minimal shapes lead me to. And most of the time, there is, I wouldn't say there is always a concept before. Sometimes there is no concept. There's just music and colors. And the end result is sometimes also just colors. And sometimes it's a bit more. It's a bit story, for example. That's the way everyone else has their own, let's say, entrance to art. What's your entrance to art? How do you get to art? I would say it just comes, right? And usually I have to be in a place of... So let's say if I'm stressed out, it's hard for me to create anything. It usually comes from a joyful state, I would say. I can find inspiration everywhere. And you see something and you immediately have an association with something and you want to create something. But the point is you see something and then you want to create this, what you already experienced? Or do you have, like, let's say, another layer? For example, a shape or a situation? and then you want to transform this one by one it can be a component of something yeah. bigger and sometimes if i started to create something and i can't finish it and there's certain components i'm missing and during my day i somehow stumble upon something that inspires me and i exactly know this is the component this is i would say how it works for me that's interesting i'm not walking around let's say scanning my environment with my artistical eye that's not what i am doing i think it's more how do you say it? it's subconscious it's more like you have something in your mind but you don't really know where it's from it's like it's there it's in your memories and then you somehow start to dig and start to create something and then it makes like plop 
and it's there and you think, wow, this is like, whoa, I remember this situation. I just had a red anger a couple of weeks ago and I transformed it with some shapes and then I realized, wow, that was actually a view I had when I was like 15 or 16 and lived still by my parents. So there was a view from my room, my child room, and there was the moon outside and I remembered clearly there was this moment, but there was no intention to create this moment. It was just, I created and wrecked angle and used some shapes. And then I realized, wow, that is exactly this moment I experienced 25 years ago. <laughs> and that oh, was wow. really surprising. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah, that's fascinating. Yeah, it, it definitely comes from the subconscious, I would say. Do you actually keep track of your ideas that come to you sometimes? Or it's just I really try. random? Yeah, no, I try, but it's all paperwork. And I um, used to lose my paperwork. So <laughs> I try to keep the ideas somewhere. But most of the time I forget them and then I just create and out of nowhere, like this window I explained, this idea comes back. So I noticed that most of your work, you really focus on a singular object, if, if I can say that. And in your newest collection, Blinded, you use mostly rectangles, long standing rectangles, projecting a shadow. And there's this one piece where you actually have several of these rectangles mm -hmm. and one is standing out in red. It's on piece, right? Yes. So is there a story behind that? Why there's this one particular piece that is standing out? Yeah, there's always a story behind the piece, especially for this one, which is kind of, let's say, special because this was a reflection of the last year of my NFT journey. And I think the idea behind the piece is mainly that, well, I'm actually bad at storytelling, but I think... No, you're good. Exactly. You're actually good. <laughs> no. You're good at that. Well, the main idea is just, it's always one special one. And there's always a group. And that was my feeling of the last NFT year. So you had like many really amazing artists out there. And some were really always on the news and always on my Twitter feed, for example. And then you had like many others, including myself. But if I want to be honest, everyone wants to be this one. Everyone wants to be the special one that everyone else is looking at. So I just had the intention to do a piece for myself that kind of, let's say, focuses on my year on the year 22, which was really intense probably for every artist who started in 22. It's the first year writing that journey. But yeah, it's a different piece. I would say from the whole Blinded series, this piece is probably the one that has the most content in it, the most story, because normally I'm not the one who wants to tell you a story. I'm just the one who wants to open your mind and you are going to tell me your story rather than I'm going to tell you a story about whatever. So this is more or less just a visual I did for myself, but already went to a, a great collector and friend. So yeah. Yeah, that piece stood out for me immediately when I saw it. I'm struggling with pictures having too many elements in it. Normally I, for every visual that you see on my website, I do like 30 to 45 outputs. And this was like, I'm not sure. I think I did 70 or something. And just not about the geometry. It's about the colors that the whole mood is actually the mood I want to create. And I'm fighting against myself not to put in too much content because I'm not a storyteller or I try not to be a storyteller. Casper, you have a question. Yeah, and I know you said that you are not really a storyteller. And you did mention that to see through the eye of your minimalist art, you need to understand the process, the emotions that you go through. I'm always interested in a lot more detail about an artist's backstory and origins. And you, of course, come from a very technical background as an architect. And then you mentioned a software developer. So maybe could you just share like some of your best moments that you experienced in this journey? And what was the worst that you experienced? Perhaps I'm sure you had quite a few during this bear market. As an NFT artist, as with all of us involved in the Web3 space. Yeah, you mean the best moments I had within my artistical journey since joining NFT or yeah, in general? Yeah, I think in general. And then one of the highest and one of the lowest points. Yeah. So probably the best, that's pretty easy because some ideas, when I try to visualize, let's say, a geometry or a space or whatever, and there is a really focus element and I want to do it as abstract as possible, sometimes I challenge my kids and I just show them the concept and I show them a blank paper with the geometry on it. I just ask, what do you see? And when my daughter sees it and starts to tell me, wow, this looks like that. And you remember when we were like, these are just the perfect moments. That's really what my art is about. When my daughter tells me she sees what I want to put in just with a few elements, that's always the best. Then I know, well, I'm on the right track. 
even if I'm not selling it or whatever, that's a good journey. She understands, well, she's happy, I'm happy, we're all happy, cool. Let's go this path. But besides that, well, what was the hardest? I think it's when you start being an NFT artist and everyone else is like flying and it's always on the feed and everyone else is selling because this whole NFT space is, I mean, it's mainly driven by cryptocurrency and sales. But when you see like everyone else around you is selling, for example, it's always the moment when I need to refocus myself that it's not about the selling because I did like the art thing for the last 12 years and shared for six or seven years art on Instagram just for a like or a comment. So it never has been about the money, but being on NFT Twitter and seeing all the success stories around you makes you really like FOMO and you really feel stressed about it. These are the moments actually when I need to refocus myself and say to myself, well, calm down, calm down. It's about the art. Whatever happens will happen or may not, but keep your eyes on the art. And for you, there was never a doubt that there's no turning back from being an NFT artist? I'm sure you must have saved a lot of money from being an architect. Well, being an architect is not the job <laughs> where you earn <laughs> that much money. <laughs> At least in Germany, it's not. Oh, okay. But back to my question. So there was never a doubt turning back? Well, it's about the art. I mean, even if I wouldn't sell anything, I still would create art. I need just this time for myself to create and explore new things. When I grew up, I had epilepsy. I had it until I was like 14 or 15. I had to go to the hospital many times of the year. And I've always been this really kind of, how do you say, ADHD guy. And this art thing really helps me to focus on just one element, just focus on the moment and really calms myself down. And so even without this whole NFT, whatever thing, I still would create art and share it on Twitter or on Instagram. So yeah, doubt. Yeah, sure. There's doubt. Whenever I create, let's say I create an art piece or I create for two or three weeks and there is just not a good piece. I feel, I wouldn't say stressed, but I feel I need to focus more on my art. Oh, thanks very much for sharing, Jan. No worries, I hope that with this sharing, maybe some of our listeners can also understand a little bit more about the background to your story and how it helps contribute to your lovely art. And of course, when your daughter can read Daddy's Mind from just a geometric shape, I'm sure the feeling must be amazing. So Absolutely, yeah. It's worth it. Do we have any final questions from the other co-hosts? If not, then thank you, Jan, for this amazing space. And it has been really fun and also insightful to chat with you and learn about your process. I hope I didn't confuse you too much. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> it's really amazing. And thank you to our co-hosts for joining today. And have a great Sunday, everyone. Talk to you next week. Bye. Thanks so much, Jan. Thank you very much. For Bye. Having me. Bye.